In February of 1949, detectives entered a workshop in West Sussex as part of an investigation, and what they found was extremely horrifying. And with this almost unbelievable discovery, they would go on to solve a string of murders done by one of England's most prolific serial killers. To understand what these detectives found, let's go back a tad bit and start from the beginning. Viewer discretion is advised. John George Hay was born on July 24, 1909, in Stamford, Lincolnshire, England, to parents Robert Hay and his wife Haley. John didn't have the worst upbringing considering the time period that he grew up in. Dubbed the Edwardian era, named after King Edward VII, George would attend classic music concerts and receive various awards during his academic years. However, his family was very religious and told John that if he was to ever sin, God would use a branding iron to mark him, as John's dad had a branding on his forehead. His mother, however, would never bear a mark as she is an angel making her an exception. This way of thinking had profound impact on his development as we would see later on during his life. Throughout the years, he seemed to have a regular life until he was about 25. It would all come crashing down. You see, John would get married and try to live a normal life. However, his twisted way of thinking would get the better of him, and he would be arrested and charged with fraud. Following John's arrest, his then pregnant wife would decide to leave him and put their baby up for adoption. After it was born, his family also decided that they wanted absolutely nothing to do with him. You would think this would deter John from fraudulent activities. However, post-release, he would continue to repeat the same things that had landed him in prison in the first place and would be in and out of prison multiple times. You see, John loved the idea of acquiring wealth without the burdens of honest labor, and this character trait would be the main reason John would go on to do some of the horrible things he later did in his life. Haunted by financial ambitions, John's life took a dark and irreversible turn. After being sent to prison again for committing fraudulent activities, John came to a realization that if the victims of his crimes are the ones that are going to the police afterwards and getting him in trouble, then the simple solution would be to make sure that there are no victims left. John thought if there was no body to be found and used as evidence, he could not be charged for the crime. And what would be a good way to make a human body disappear? he asked himself, is as if a light bulb went off in his head. John took inspiration from the French serial killer named George Alexander Serrett, who met his end at the guillotine. For most people, that's enough to be a deterrent. But for John, it wasn't. However, he didn't completely think this through, and one simple mistake would prove to be detrimental. Upon his release from prison the last time, he started working at an engineering firm with a sick, sadistic plan in the back of his head. He started experimenting with sulfuric acid, dissolving field mice in jars of this stuff and observing how effectively it worked. And it was very effective. While he worked as an accountant at the firm, he ran into William McSwan, his former employer and old friend in a Kensington pub so naturally they both sparked up a conversation. While the two were catching up, McSwan introduced Hay to his parents, Donald and Amy. McSwan bragged about working for his parents as a landlord for their properties in London. This was a grave mistake, as Hay would become very jealous and envious of his lifestyle. On September 6, 1944, John would lure McSwan into an old abandoned basement, and once inside, he would use a brass pipe to brutally bash him over the head. Afterwards, he threw McSwan's body in a metal drum filled with concentrated sulfuric acid, waiting for this bath to do its stuff. Two days later, finding that the body was mostly dissolved, he poured what was left down a manhole, getting rid of the remains forever. Hay told McSwan's parents that their son was hiding in Scotland to avoid the draft as a cover-up. He then took their son's place, living with them and collecting rent at their properties. However, they became worried about their son, who had not returned once the war was over, which they found very suspicious. On July 2, 1945, Hay would then lure Donald and Amy to Gloucester Road by telling them that their son had returned for a surprise visit. He then proceeded to brutally strike the couple in the head over and over again until they were deceased and same as before, he threw their bodies in sulfuric acid, dissolving them. Posing as their son afterwards, Hay stole their pension checks and sold their properties for almost 10,000 pounds, using the money to later move to the Onslow Court Hotel in South Kensington. But as a result of having a gambling problem, John ran out of his stolen funds by 1947. This gave him the urge to find his next victims to kill and rob. Once again, Hay would soon meet Dr. Archibald Henderson and his wife Rose Henderson. He pretended to be interested in a house they were selling, and taking a liking to him, 
Rose invited him to play piano at their housewarming party, and while at their flat, he also stole Dr. Henderson's revolver, which he would go on to use sometime in the future. John, who has now committed multiple murders, decided to relocate his operations, moving his metal drums and setting up shop in a small space up for rent on Leopold Road in West Sussex. On February 12, 1948, he drove Dr. Henderson to his workshop, telling him that he wanted to show him an invention. When they entered his workshop, he shot Dr. Henderson in the head without hesitation. Afterwards, he would call Mrs. Henderson, telling her she needed to come because her husband had fallen ill. This proved to be a grave mistake as he shot her in the head with the same revolver he had stolen from their house the year prior. After covering up the murders using his typical method of an acid bath, he forged their signatures on a letter that allowed him to sell their possessions for 8,000 pounds. He sold everything but their dog and their car, keeping them for himself. I guess he had a soft spot for dogs. After the five murders, John Hay rented a larger warehouse on Leopold Road with more space for his drums and acid concoctions. Here, he would kill and dissolve his final victim. Olive Duran Deacon was a wealthy widow who also lived at the Onslow Court Hotel. Olive thought herself something of an inventor, and upon finding out that John worked at an engineering firm, asked if she could talk to him about an idea she had for artificial fingernails. This was music to John's ears as he took the opportunity to lure her to his warehouse and tragically murder her there. When Mrs. Durand was still missing the following day, it became apparent that something was wrong. To keep the guests from becoming suspicious of him, Hay asked Mrs. Lane, a concerned guest from the previous day, if she had heard anything about the missing woman. Mrs. Lane said that she hadn't heard anything and planned to go to the Chelsea police station later. He offered to join her and drove Mrs. Lane to the police station to file a missing person report. When they arrived at the station initially, Sergeant Lamborn was a little apprehensive about John. Something seemed a little off about the fella. And the following morning, the sergeant contacted the Scotland Yard record office and discovered John's history. That same morning, Hay went to his warehouse to empty Mrs. Duran's liquefied body. He made the simple and stupid decision of pouring it on the ground outside. He then drove to Horsham to have Duran's jewelry appraised. When he returned to the hotel, a group of officers were waiting for him. He gave them a statement that retold his story about the missed meeting. The following Saturday, the police would decide to investigate John's warehouse on Leopold Road. This is where things took a turn. They discovered a rubber apron, a gas mask, empty glass carboys, a recently fired revolver, and a dry cleaning receipt for Mrs. Duran's Persian fur coat during their investigation. After finding the evidence in the warehouse, they decided to further search the surrounding area. It didn't take very long to make this shocking discovery. On a pile of rubble behind the building, the detectives found 28 pounds of melted body fat, part of a person's foot gallstones and part of a denture. Maybe pouring it outside wasn't a bad idea. As with that, they had identified their prime suspect. No prizes for guessing who, of course. There was nowhere he could run or hide. The acid bath killer has now finally been caught. Hayes' trial was nothing short of a media sensation. Despite a feeble attempt to plead insanity, he was convicted of multiple murders. The year 1949 marked the end of his horrifying spree, as John George Hay met his fate at the gallows, where he was hanged. He left behind a legacy of terror and a trail of unanswered questions, and just before his demise, he was asked by one of the guards if he'd like a drink of brandy. And in a calm tone, John replied, Make it a large one, old boy. Thank you so much for sticking through to the end. If you enjoyed today's story, please consider liking and subscribing. Share your ideas, thoughts, and suggestions in the comments below. And while you're at it, why not check out this video?